Uh, welcome back to UK Pro Muscle Podcast. This is going to be, I believe, episode three. And we was meant to have a bit of a roundtable, but Joe has actually bailed. So we will do a part two to this uh, for sure. Uh, but today I've got two very special guests on. We've got Luke back and we've got Mr. John Jewett. Again, both guys are definitely leaders, I would say, in industry when it comes to education and when it comes to ability to share light on how to maximize your progress and still have longevity in mind, which today's episode is literally all about that. So I definitely think it's a topic that is bound to get spoke about with a bit more emphasis on health and productivity in the game and longevity. So I think definitely something I wanted to get, you know, Luke and John on board with and get them to share the views. So first, you know, I think uh, they don't need much introductions, but I will let them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they are, what they offer and uh, where we can find them. And most of all, you know, um, John's site as well. I think that's definitely a, a very, very helpful thing, which I've actually joined up. Many of you will have seen it on my YouTube already um, doing the JFU University. It's, it's incredible. Honestly, the amount of content guys there you will find is unbelievable. So anyone watching this, if you truly want to level up as a coach, as an athlete, I highly advise jumping on board with that. Um, and actually, John mentioned something about you guys making some uh, videos as well, which I'm actually excited about. Uh, so guys, introduce yourself, plug yourself away before we get stuck in. Who's first? Do I get to go? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's me. Uh, thanks for the introduction pretty much already. Um, uh, I'm glad to be here, man. Um, it's always a pleasure to chat with you and everything you put out too. And it's been cool to see how vastly you've been growing in knowledge set, and especially being in a young bodybuilder, which I like, feel like I came into this kind of later to learn a lot, which I wish I could go back. We spoke about that, but anyway, um, yeah, I, I have BB pro 212 competitor turn pro in, in uh, 2016 and I'm a registered dietitian as well. So I've been in the more of the nerdy game for a long time and just needed to learn how to maximize all my variables. Cause I never saw myself as being like the genetic elite or at least I couldn't change my genetics anyway. So I was like, anything else I can do to maximize it. And that has come now to where I realized 10 years down the road, I'm still bodybuilding. So what, what do I need to do to be able to continue to do this in the long haul? But um, for, for people that want to follow me, um, more most active on IG at John Jew at three. Um, I am not taking a lot of coaching clients on. It just has to be the, the right fit. Um, but I am doing some, some consults and my big focus, like you said, is, uh, J3 university. So that's been my project, my passion project for a while. And just everything that I've wanted to learn and, and gather as far as the whys behind what we do, how can we do them more effectively and how can we just decrease risk in what we do? Cause we, we're going to take risk as bodybuilders, but I don't, I, but still see out our goals. So by no means is this going to be like, hey, we're going to be so conserved that we're not you know, seeing our goals out. But um, yeah, that's the coursework that I've, I've put together and uh, it's continues to grow. So and I continue to learn. So I'm a forever student. So even within it, I don't come to me thinking I know everything because I, I still have a J3 university will be continually adapted. So I, I go back and I'm like, oh, man, I got to redo these these lectures because I have a different thought process on, on things. But Anyway, and then Luke is uh, soon to be announced as like going to be with within this too with J3 University, and we uh, put together some modules that are going to be exciting to come out. So, Luke, who are you? <laughs> no switch fitness. No, uh, no switch fitness. Uh, Y'all guys kind of got an introduction to me in the last podcast with like everything I do from a coaching perspective and an education perspective. Um, Obviously, I did run my own podcast, but I'm very blessed to be a part of J3U as like co-host on that podcast and everything that we're going to be doing on the J3U website moving forward with our module and future content to come there. So from an education standpoint, you'll be able to catch a lot of my educational content through that through that website at J3U. So you guys make sure you aren't missing out on that. Um, we also do seminars. So we definitely got another seminar coming up October 24th in San Antonio, Texas um, in It'll be it's fast approaching by the time this will be released. So make sure you guys get your tickets there. And 
coaching is coaching and educating is my passion, right? Like I compete elite from the front, which is what we talked about in the last podcast, but um, investing everything into my clientele and moving that as far forward as possible is where I truly see like what I'm meant to do as far as a coach and an educator. So um, it's definitely a passion of mine when it comes to bridging the gap between what we see in research and what we see anecdotally and finding best practices for that long-term vector of progress over time. So uh, it's definitely, definitely an area that you'll, you'll hear me get pretty riled up about, especially within the context of the conversations we're going to be having today. So I'm really excited to just get plugged in. Yeah. I think this is the great thing about you two guys. It's, it's something I actually spoke with John about is about not being closed off to just one idea and continuous to learn and continue making progress. Like this is exactly why I love bodybuilding so much because there's always ways that you can be better and find a better way. And I think in our case, that actually means a healthier way at the same time. So I think today's conversation and today's topic is super, super important, um, especially for me, being a younger bodybuilder that has made the mistakes that, I, that could have been rectified, that I could have not made. I think it's very important for me to speak about this so that maybe the viewers that are watching right now that are, are younger, especially, do not make the same mistakes that I did, which inevitably has, I believe, cost me a lot of progress. Like, that's the conversation I had with John and yourself, Luke. Like, doing the silly things and, and pushing the dosages and staying on for too long has certainly cost me a lot of progress. And this is exactly why, you know, you two guys are always my go-to people when, you know, I've got questions. This is why I consult with John on a regular basis. And this is why I've got you as well now, Luke, on board of my training. Because, again, I want to continue to learn and I do not want to make any more mistakes. Because arguably, you know, I'm in this for, for the long haul. And, you know, I want to be competing when I'm John's age with no issues and no health implications. You know, I want to, I want to be competing until I'm 40 and I'm, you know, till I'm 27 now. So in order for me to be able to do that, I think we definitely need to present today that there is a better way to be able to maximize the progress and get to where you want to be whilst taking the risk, but minimizing the harmful effects that come with them. And I think this is definitely something that needs to be spoke of much more in this day and age, because I think the gap is still very, very too far in between, between actual application of you know, smart, collected approach versus the bro science and application of just stupid, stupid, retarded protocols. So let's dig in, guys. Let's dig in. Uh, we'll maybe let um, John start with maybe what we actually see done, done mostly in, in a wrong way right now that, that could be done a little bit better. Um, I think it's definitely certainly a conversation that we have had on a consult before. Um, you know, with, with mapping out things and, and definitely something I shared with you both from, from my previous experience, especially in off season with not, you know, taking long enough off or pushing past a certain boundary where I believe, you know, certain, certain pushes are just not beneficial. And if anything, they are counterproductive to your progression. So let's get stuck in. Yeah. And that's not to say when I, you know, when I was younger and coming up, it was always just this acute look at the, what's the next prep and the next show. What do I need to take to make that next move up? And you want that so bad because you're trying to like really prove yourself in the sport. So the risk you just set aside and kind of are in denial about, and you think you're, you, you do think you're young and that it won't be impactful. And I just remember like pushing at nationals, like the amount of gear I was taking was outrageous. Um, it, it had to be close to three grams with every oral, every oral in place and multiple estrogen blockers and aromatase inhibitors. And was that necessary? And what I've come to, over the years to realize is like, look at my look now and I've achieved like some of the most, the best conditioning that I've ever brought to stage. And I can look back and just kind of filter through and understand like, what was what the hell was I doing for one but uh it, it makes a little bit you know retrospective in the, the fact of being able to sort through it all and understand what was going in place and for what reason and I can start pulling away what was needed and what 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 was it 
but I still, from that moment, I've used less and less and less, but I've still achieved a higher and higher level. And, and so that's what I want to just like preface that with that. It, it's not going to take away from the outcomes, but there needs to be a gradient approach within this, but within just using a safer use model, I think the, the idea needs to be like, what, what is the, what is the risk that we're really presenting here? And it's to really look at the long-term outcomes that you see within bodybuilding, which are probably going to be the, the big target organs. Where do you see bodybuilders passing away? And a lot of times it's cardiovascular disease, heart attacks. So heart um, next is going to be people going in kidney failure, going to dialysis, stress on the kidneys. We also probably have even longer term effects that are harder to see because it's so multivariable over a long stretch would be the effects of the brain and maybe potential in dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, then we have like the more of the acute risk of just liver damage and injury around that. But again, what all this boils down to is there's this large systemic stress load that you're presenting onto the body and all organ systems. And this, this is really what can be seen out long-term. And a lot of times it might be fine just looking at acute lab markers and you're good because you're young and you can handle it. But that does not mean that you're still not imposing damage and risk on these other tissues that are there. And you'll just see it out long-term. So we want to put protective measures in place. And just from the beginning, understand those risks that this is not a a healthy approach, you will take risk and maybe you'll escape it and you'll escape bodybuilding. Maybe you won't. And you're going to be the guy that does accumulate some, some issues, but this, there's no approach that, that doesn't remove all risk. And that's what you need to know getting into it when you step into this realm. And so my thought process is how can I mitigate those risks to those organ systems? And it, it, it just comes down to using the least effective dosage that you can. And I think that's almost where the conversation begins with someone that's going to be starting out. And this is going beyond the poise, choice of like you want to use or you don't want to use, et cetera. It's like, hey, I want a body build. Okay, you're going to start using. Where does that position start at and what should we put in place? So I don't know, I guess that's where my mind kind of travels working backwards. Like where does the, the end outcome occur health-wise for us and, and what should we do from the beginning to see out the, the best health outcomes uh, for those systems. Um, yeah, I think, do you know what, there's some great points there because if I had that kind of knowledge when I first started, I know I would be a lot further ahead of what I am now and genuinely I, I would be a lot healthier. So I think the biggest point that people need to realize is you can get so much more out of less and I think I've shown that the past year and I will continue showing that throughout the soft season. Like I'm very much determined to share a lot more of what can be done using the safer model, especially this year and this off season when training variables are right. When, you know, your nutrition's on point, your recovery's on point. When you're paying attention to all these other variables that do elicit the actual hypertrophy much more than just, just the drugs itself, because I've learned the hard way. Drugs itself, without the application, do very, very little because like John said, I've been able to use less and less every single year and make far more progress. And I'm confident this year I can repeat that and I can really keep you know, the ceiling much, much lower throughout as well. And I think that's something that's very exciting for me because again, something that, that I always say to John is like, if people looked at what you actually do with your use, they wouldn't believe it. And I know for a fact, people still don't because I have conversations with people that ask me and they don't believe it genuinely. If people ask what Luke does and what he's just done for his rebound and how he looks and how much muscle tissue he has gained while staying so lean, people wouldn't believe it. And people already don't because I've had conversations with people about that already as well. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and you know what guys, it's like, I'm like this, look, like, I know John and I know Luke and I know they wouldn't lie. Like, they're just not them type of guys. They've got nothing to hide. They're both educators. They both share everything through black and white. Like, what have they got to gain through lying? And people still do not believe it. It's like, okay, well, if that's what you want to do, then no problem. But obviously, this is exactly why I think this topic is just so important. And, and this, this conversation is just so important to have. And, you know, we, me and Luke briefly mentioned it. 
uh, in the last podcast as well, as to what truly can be done when you know what you're doing and you're not, you know, you, you're being sensible. Yeah, I think, I think too, like, as we kind of wade into like this conversation of progression over time and what that may look like, some pre preface material on the front end. Um, first off, like you can't coach the human body unless you understand the human body and getting with someone that kind of understands that from like a mechanistic standpoint from all variables, whether it be nutrition, training, EDs is, is really important. And so that would be kind of like some of the preface material that I would kind of put out there is if you don't feel like you understand that to the level that you should is, is getting with someone who you know does and then self-educating because there is a lot of power in, in you educating yourself and the way that you interact with your coach and, and getting into plugged into things that will educate you in a proper manner on basic physiology and understanding how we interact with these things. And then as a secondary consideration, the financial considerations around that before we kind of dive into what progression over time looks like, because like one of the big things John mentioned was like, like testing and, and, and understanding how each compound selection is going to affect your health over the long term. That testing not is not always the cheapest route, right? And you can't just sit here and prioritize spending a thousand dollars a month on growth hormone while at the same time not pulling the lab work, right? Or not getting the echocardiogram or not doing whatever it may be. Um, and so like I think that that preferential it's preferential to have that basic understanding wading into this realm so that as we start to kind of dive into what the progression model over time looks like, it's, it's an understanding of a needs analysis based deployment of compounds. And that's where I think John and I are really trying to push that, that understanding that we shouldn't just deploy compounds because X guy at the gym said so, or because he got great results with that. It's like, how can we mechanistically drive an adaptation that we want to see upon the deployment of whatever compound we're putting in place? So I think that that's kind of where it starts. And then the biggest mistake around that, and to kind of let John kick off on this, is the large escalation straight out the gate, right? It's the large escalation straight out the gate to see the acute response that you want to see and feel like Superman in the gym, which we, we touched on a little bit, but I think that kind of setting the basis of the pathways that we may be considering and maybe what should be in play of, uh, across the first initial implementation and then starting to dive into like ways to manage that and then progress it over time as well. Yeah. With, uh, with that being said, and that's a good point too, because we, we mentioned like we're getting more out of less now, which really we've learned all our variables are, are implemented so much more and being younger, we could mask poor nutrition or just poor training just with a higher drug amount. And so you never really learn those other variables really well. So I think even with this approach, it, it allows you to really pull out and understand if you're getting the most out of the other variables or not. And you have to take a hard look at all those other things that are harder to do than sticking a needle in, in your ass um, of looking at sleep are you doing, mul are you trying to work multiple jobs and prep at the same time? Well, dude, no wonder you're not fucking growing and you're sleeping five hours a night. Um, are you nailing your meals and your routine? Like all that stuff is how you're going to get more out of less, but starting from a, a lower starting point will help you milk everything out of those variables before you're at that level where you, the choice is that not that, oh, now I should improve my sleep or my, my training. No, the only choice you have left after you've nailed everything is escalate the dosage. But with that being said, you know, um, things that I think you're going to have to be, just be aware of to be in place, and at least what I, if you're going down that path, is um, lab work every 10 weeks, pulling serum labs and a urinalysis, have that in mind, which could be, you know, that's like 200 US dollars, roughly, depending, um, monitoring blood pressure once a week, easy thing to do, I monitor blood glucose once a week. Um, and then a yearly echocardiogram, which these are things that I would, I just already have in place in your mind. These are what you need to do. If you're going to go down this road, I don't want to have, I want to get to our point here of like, you know, actual implementation of, of a model, but uh, just that out the gate. Um, but at least as a starting point, if you're, if you're planning to it, I use testosterone as, as always our starting point and coming from a place of, where do we need to take that as far as progression goes? And we look at 
testosterone replacement. Um, obviously, if you're replacing testosterone for what you're endogenously producing, you probably won't effect, right? If it's the same that you naturally produce, so you need some type of escalation beyond what would be natural. Um, and I would say, well, why is testosterone really our, our starting place for us? And why should it always be a backbone in a cycle? A lot of this does come down to, for one, the, the growth promoting aspects, but also the health aspects that it, it can provide. So we know estradiol, testosterone will convert into estradiol, also dehydrotestosterone, with estradiol being a very protective hormone. So estradiol has um, effects on uh well, for one, just steroid use in general is neurotoxic, renal toxic, hepatotoxic, cardiotoxic, while estrogen is basically the opposite. So estrogen has a protective effect. We see when we, when we lower estrogen to very low levels, you see lipid skewing. You see an increase in amyloid deposition in the brain. Um, you see more uh, renal issues. So we want some baseline of estrogen. And honestly, with estrogen being protective, I want it as high as I possibly can tolerate um, before making other choices for compound usage. Now, dehydrotestosterone also has some beneficial effects as far as the nervous system goes, libido function goes. Um, so you also want some level of DHT, and this is something you're, you're naturally producing in the body. So testosterone should be a base, and the starting point should be what I would use slightly above a hormone replacement level, which for most guys, this is going to be 200 milligrams a week. A lot of guys, that's going to push you beyond, but you don't know. Some guys, that's within normal. Some guys are super physiological, and it just depends on your inter individual response. And that's what you need to find out before you add in, let me start at 500 milligrams of test. That's what I did my first cycle. To be honest, and, I think and, that's pretty much what I and, did. I and I, I also started with an aromatase inhibitor because I don't know why. That's what I thought I was supposed to do. Yeah. It's like, man, and I was, I was started from my natural level to like, you know, four times above I blew up, but then I shrank down I'm like, well, well shit. I, and it was only 12 weeks long. Why was it 12 weeks long? I don't know. That's how long you're supposed to do it for. I thought, <laughs> um, then I just stopped taking everything. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, so it what should that really look be, like? It always used to be like a blanket statement. That's it. You're going to go cycle for 12 weeks and then you're going to have to come off for six weeks. That yeah. Year, why? Like, why? Why is it 12 weeks? Why is it six weeks? Like these are the questions I ask. Why 500 milligrams? Um, and so what I would suggest now is you start at 200. You see, you see out that result. You pull labs at your 10 week mark. You see that response. You see your health markers. Are you, is your performance improving? Are your health markers in check? Well, fuck yeah, they are. Well, cool, keep going. Don't come off. Why would you come off? Well, I need to restore my natural levels. Well, I'll tell you with continued steroid use, the oxidation to the testes, uh, if, you, if you plan down this road, you're gonna end up on TRT either way. Um, I don't see the benefit anymore. If you plan to do this now, you, maybe you're just getting into it and you could justify doing a PCT coming off, but at some point you're only going to be dropping back down. I think it's more health risk of this hormone fluctuations and you, the, the, the road will end in the same spot that you'll need hormone replacement and to see out your goals to the high level that like we're all trying to be at, you're, you're going to stay on year round. Um, and so as far as cycle duration goes for a beginner, I would ride that out as long as possible until you see progress stall or you see some type of health marker detriment. Now, I think you can ride this out for probably well over a year, which I would be escalating testosterone only, probably 50 milligram in increments yep. um, as needed until I reach a point where I can no longer tolerate the estrogen side effects. And what might those be? Well, it could be maybe it's affecting libido. Uh, maybe there can be more anxiety or sleep issues with higher estrogen levels. Potentially, what you guys might see first is going to be like maybe some type of nipple sensitivity or gynecomastia or a blood pressure issue. At that point, whatever you end up, and usually for a lot of guys, I'm seeing this probably around 300 milligrams average, you know, depending. Some guys lower, some guys a little higher. Uh, but you take that as far as you can go and tolerate estrogen. And then wherever you're like, oh man, 300 milligrams, that was it. Like I'm, I'm starting to like my blood pressure's up, like libido feels off. Well, cool. Back it down to 250. And that's, that's, you now know 
your physiological need of where you can go super physiological with testosterone and, and manage that without needing an aromatase inhibitor yet. Because if you go higher, you're going to need one. But that's when we talk about bringing in a second drug deployment. But throughout this process, we're just incrementally increasing. And that first run for someone that's just starting out, that could be well over a year of just this slow escalation, milking everything out. So it's not a 12 week cycle. Why stop after 12 weeks? Well, what, what's the rationale? What it needs to base off health markers and what probably was going to happen first is that you're probably going to run. And we talked about this Cuba, like you're going to run into issues with pushing food and just having to pull back because of digestion getting off or inflammations off because your just body fat's getting too high. At that point, if you're pulling back, well, you, you could pull back dosage to a maintenance level before escalating back up again. So that's uh, that's at least like starting out a beginner, what I would consider with testosterone deployment. And that's, that's not also like other compounds I would deploy within that too, um, as far as like health compounds in mind, but I'll, uh, uh, I won't, I won't, won't take up all the, the talking space here. <laughs> to be so. fair, to be fair, you've actually covered that on your one of your lectures in J3U. So if you want to dig deeper into that, guys, you have to sign up. Um, but I think definitely a point worth to mention, John. That twelve month cycle would wouldn't likely go above three four hundred milligram total. I think that's one big thing that that we need to kind of cover and mention, because when we're talking about cycles, people have got a, a misconception that it would be you know. What do you mean, John said run a cycle for twelve months? What do you mean? Like it wouldn't be your usual cycle of you know seven hundred milligrams or a gram. It would literally be starting off at two hundred milligrams and titrating up by fifty milligrams as of when needed. So you could be going up 50 milligrams in two, three months time and then going up by another 50 milligrams in two, three months time. So that is what John means by, you know, a 12 month cycle. It would probably start 200 milligrams and it would likely end at 350, 400. Not, and, and you, not above that. You, and you can see within the, we have the testosterone dosage study by, um, I was it? gosh, now, now the name just blanked me. I had it and left me. But anyway, it was looking at dose dosages of testosterone, 75 milligrams, 125 milligrams, 300, 600 milligrams. And, and the, the, uh, that was for 20 weeks. And the skewing of labs within even the 300 milligram group was just a little bit less in HDL. And, and you're talking like for that amount of dosage over that long term, you're going to see minimal health skewing. Um, so that's like something to be said. So we're not saying like you run a gram for a year, like, yeah, you have problems. <laughs> that's probably why you need to come off in 12 weeks, but this is, this is starting off from a baseline. This is a beginner, right? So we have advanced guys and this is a different conversation, but at least from a, a starting standpoint. Absolutely. And then I think that starts to build out like more inclusion criteria from there, right? Like outside of the, the health consideration is like, progressions from there what does it look like because we can't just create a 275 pound open body bloater on 250 megs of test right so it's like where where can we start to include compounds that allow for progression over time what pathways can we utilize and my obviously the first in order to reach a higher ceiling of tests is going to be a dht derivative so we're looking at like primobolin or masteron as an inclusion criteria within that um, so that we can drive the test up a little bit more alongside that. And then secondarily, depending upon uh, level would be like a growth hormone and obviously financial considerations. And, and these are kind of creating the baselines of what we would consider like start points before we go into the further escalations is like making sure that we're able to not only address different pathways within the inclusion of growth hormone, but also create a progression model over time that allows us to minimize AI usage because like to, to John's point, like high estradiol is going to be very anabolic when we look at like growth periods over time. And that needs to be included. And just to provide some clarification on something that John said is like, people don't really understand. You say amyloid accumulation in the brain is like something and they just kind of scoff that off because they don't understand. Like that's a precursor to Alzheimer and dementia. And like that should be very, very seriously taken into consideration alongside the other organs that we're tracking. And so we don't want to be writing cycle designs that require a lot of AI usage. Um, and we can use AIs in a acute deployment to see if without pulling labs to see if the estradiol is elevated and then change that type design accordingly. 
but we should probably be moderating stack design in order to allow progress over time, more so than relying on the AIs as a chronic use. And then to further John's point of the 12 month cycle, like we're not saying the 12 month cycle is a complete bulking cycle with linear progression up like this, right? There's gonna be pullback periods where we have to reset progress to his point from like a nutritional standpoint as well, a body composition standpoint for most people as well. And so we talk about this from a long-term progress perspective because the pullbacks are meant more just to reset variables within the nutritional standpoints and body comp standpoints. And we're not having to spend 10, 12, 14 weeks fixing health variables, right? There may be a time in which you have to pull back if we start to see skewing of labs, but it's not going to be of the duration of 14, 15, 16, 17 weeks just to see lab work that comes back clean, which then starts to bring up the other point of only testing when you're off, which is why we suggest like the eight to 10 week lab pools is like, we need to be understanding like the chronic stress or the stress that's accumulating over time and what that represents within our health markers, because that warrants the elevations in stack design as we go. Yeah, I think that that's an excellent point. I think the reason why we test labs as well is to see when we need to pull back. I think that's the most important thing too. You know, I think at the moment, people are so happy to spend money on every single supplement and every single pet going in the world, but they're not willing to spend 180, 180 pound on a full blood panel. And I think that's definitely where they go wrong. Like all this past year, every single, pretty much every six to eight weeks, I've done a full blood panel every single, every single time. And the data that I've had, not just from the health markers, but for all the other hormones as well, including my estradiol, including obviously my test levels and being able to modulate my stack. So I don't have to use an AI has been definitely very, very valuable in, in being able to keep my health in check as well. And, you know, feeling fresh still, you know, a week out from the show. Um, I could have felt fresher, arguably. Yes. You know, I could have felt fresher, but um, nevertheless, I felt a lot worse. So I think it's definitely invaluable in my opinion. You, you also learn too, Kuba, like, what compounds react within you and what you might need to stay away from. And before I like touch more on what Luke said, like for instance, for, uh, for Tampa, I, I took 10 milligrams of super draw for four days. I pulled my labs two days after that. My HDL was just crashed. My liver enzymes were like five times normal. Wow. And it's like, man, like it was so impactful. And for what I gained was like nothing. Like it brought nothing more to my physique. And so that was just like eh, an X on that, you know, because it's like, it didn't bring me anything. It only detrimented my, my health markers. I wouldn't have known that if I didn't pull my labs. Um, Cause I felt fine. Um, so it's just a one thing too, that you can help you understand how you react to individual compounds as well. Uh, but getting back to like on, on Luke's, Luke's point of like a second compound, you know, deployment, why would we pick this DHT marker in general? Because, and you, I think you need to understand like with the aromatase inhibitors, like why not go to 400 tests with an AI? It's like the AIs in general, what we see they're made for breast cancer patients. And we see long-term use of AIs uh, leads to cardiotoxicity, atherosclerosis within those breast cancer, cancer patients. And this is what we will deal with in bodybuilding is further risk of cardiovascular disease. So we just don't need it present. So the idea is like, well, rather than adding that hundred milligrams as testosterone with an AI, why don't we add hundred milligrams of another compound that doesn't aromatize? Cause you're basically building the same cycle without the AI. What is a non-aromatizable version of testosterone? Well, it's like a DHT derivative, like Masteron or Primabolin. But why go, why go there? And why not like a a 19 nor derivative, like one of the more like like a Nandrolone or a Trimbolone? And, and within looking at those compounds, the progestins, those seem to be more neurotoxic. They're also more suppressive as well. So if you had some guy that was starting out, maybe this isn't for him. He's like, you know what? I'm done with this, man. I actually want to come off. I don't want to do this anymore. Well, you can accumulate probably more oxidative stress damage with those compounds and make it much harder to regain your natural testosterone production. So that's why I would still go with the fact of using um, like a, a DHT, like a Mastron or a Primabolin. 
Um, also for the fact too, that it's a much more manageable compound because within an angelone, it has binding with the progesterone receptor. It, it has some estrogen conversion. Um, it, 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 it kind of can be a little bit more messy to manage and you won't quite understand at that level how to manage all the side effects that could go along with that. So I think a DHT derivative would be the, the next best choice within it. To your point, and just to kind of set you up to tee something off, because I believe I know the answer here, I would even almost make the argument, finances aside, that a growth hormone deployment before a 19 or derivative would be preferential over deploying an NPP or a Trimblown. Yeah, yeah. So that gets into like, you want to call it the poly polypharmacy approach or the, you know, trying to utilize multiple pathways for growth outside of, because right now we're only talking about androgens, right? Yep. So there's other ways to grow outside of only deploying androgens. And I was always under the impression, and this was a mistake that I made, was you save growth hormone for when you're like a pro and you want to wait. Till amount the of times, amount of times <laughs> I hear that. Honestly, John, amount of times I hear that, it, it, it hurts my head. Yo, it's I did so a combo with a figure girl whose coach wanted to use testing trend before growth hormone. Yeah, before metformin as well. They were like, do you know what? I'm not sure about metformin, but let's do 30 milligrams of anavar every day. <laughs> to, a, to a bikini girl, 30 mig every day. I was like, okay, okay. So no metformin, no GH, no clen, but you'll use, you'll use 30 milligrams of uh, vanavar. That's... That's bueno. That's that's just one way to turn a lady into, you know, into a more of a masculine lady. Um, I think the biggest issue we're seeing right now, though, gents, is using a DHT derivative. You're not going to see the instant fullness and gratification that you will, that you will from a from a 19 norm. Unfortunately, like uh, it's something I've been said to John uh, when I was discussing what I'm going to do with my off season. It's like. Every single time I've used MPP in past, the fullness that I would get from it and the water, intracellular or whatever, it's still water. You know, it's not real muscle. You know, it's not actual muscle tissue coming on. It's just fullness. It's unbelievable. So I, I would start it and I would literally look twice as big within two weeks. Unfortunately, you don't get that from a DHT. And I think this is exactly the reason why people are so swayed towards using drugs like MPP itself. And there's still a massive stigma and a myth when people say that, you know, these drugs are less effective, they're weaker, which, you know, I think we can all agree that Mastron and Primo are certainly not weaker. We just do not get that big water retention spike and, you know, that initial boost that you see almost instantly from MPP and, and any DECA really. Um, I think that's definitely one one biggest thing to, to really mention as to why people choose certain types of drugs and the kind of stigma that's around the drugs right now with still the bro science that does preach certain drugs are still strong than others. Like people are still in the impression that, you know, Trembolone is your, is your hardest, you know, is your hardest and strongest drug. Whereas for me, Trembolone does very, very little, um, especially at higher dosages, you know, I, I definitely do favor Primo and, and, and Mastron personally. And even like I discussed with John, um, I don't think throughout this off season, I'm even going to use MPP whatsoever because of the effect I actually get from MPP. It masks where I'm at progression wise. And I don't see true progression of how much muscle tissue I'm holding or whether it's just water and fullness. And I think yeah. I don't want that when I'm pushing, when I'm reaching peak of my off season, I don't want that. I want full transparency. And I think the selection of the stack design is so important with that, but collectively that selection is also the healthiest selection. And these are the drugs that have been used in, in human research and human use for a number of years, they're all human approved, aren't they? So, you know, they are still used in medicine. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's an excellent point because you get that initial boost and it's encouraging. It's like, well, what, what is fullness? Like, yes, you get some pump, but what, what, where, what is that? Like, what is it coming from? And it's could be estrogen driven slightly by Nangelone, but largely it's driven by aldosterone increase, which we know Testanel and, and, and Nangelone increase aldosterone by quite a bit, which just causes water retention. Um, and it's going to be intra and extracellular, but that's not, that's not protein accretion. 
that's not growth. Um, and so there's no proof of like any drug milligram for milligram causing a greater protein accretion than another drug. And so within that being said, like using like a master on a primo, yes, you won't have a fast increase in water levels, but you can very well still accrue muscle tissue at, at the same rate, but probably a longer duration because you won't run into this masking, like you said, of like, is it body fat? Is it water? You drive up inflammation, also blood pressure issues that could come along with that. And then we, of course, have the long-term issue of like, hey, we want to do this for a long period of time. Not that I'm saying to never implement an angelone, because there's a level that we get to where, hey, maybe test in our primo at the tail end of that cycle, we're going to add some nangelone, reach a peak state, and then bring it back down. But it's not going to be, it doesn't need to be the basis of where our starting point is. I think the logic to that the deployment is the smart thing too, right? Because when we discuss polypharmacy and like letting estradiol ride a little bit higher for the growth hormone that's in play, um, just because of the benefit that we're going to see alongside that, like having a compound in play that's going to skew metrics like an androlone as far as from like a blood pressure metric standpoint that you point out is for the long duration of cycle, we, we don't nix nandrolone usage we deploy it as the last progression on the cycle across the phase before we might be pulling back and i think that's probably the differential and logic of like deployment that we need to start seeing um and which is why we're we maybe start to discuss the polypharm is is yeah. being able to get more without the nandro in within stack design yeah it's so, like what, yeah it's so like what I, what I mentioned earlier like i waited quite a while before i implemented growth hormone um, but there truly is a synergistic effect implementing that early on and you'll get more out of your androgens and not need as much to escalate yet. Um, so like earlier on, I would say you, you have escalated testosterone up to a point. It, you definitely could. And you say you had pulled back and, you know, you, you cut down and it was time to escalate back up. Well, there's no reason your next, next escalation could be adding in you increase testosterone again, but you add in two IUs of growth hormone, right? As a starting point. Yeah. Now you're building these synergies together with growth hormone working through IGF-1. It's much less health impactful than I would say for an androgen. Yep. And you're, you're no longer just slamming down like the one big hammer of, of androgen usage. Now, along this way, I would also build in some other aspects that could have health benefits, but they also could have some potential and more fuel utilization, especially in off season phase, like, uh, like metformin. And it's a, something that I, I truly believe in more in the in more off season state of, for one, it's been shown to decrease inflammation, oxidation, of the body, which is the issue that we run into systemically with, with anabolic usage. But also, it was just keeps you sensitive to insulin and utilizing carbohydrates. So it's, it's more just keeps you optimal, right? Um, what is the issue that a lot of times we run into? Inflammation, glucose levels are rising, you're having to put out more insulin. Well, you have something in place that can help keep that system working more efficiently for a longer period of time. Well, that means you can extend out that escalation for longer. You also be in the game longer, too. So... So having some, usually I'm, I'm starting with like 500 milligrams of metformin with, with the last meal as a ability to optimize fuel. Now for a contest prep, I leave it in, not because I, I'm already going to be sensitive to insulin, but more so for everything else that metformin brings from a health aspect. And I know people say, oh, well, it inhibits muscle growth and it, you, you haven't truly looked into the mechanisms. And also the studies are using like 1500, 2000 milligrams of metformin. There's also different isoforms of it, AMPK and mTOR that it's working on that doesn't affect like skeletal muscle hypertrophy. And where it's getting deployed is also individuals that aren't using testosterone and they're old and they're not weight training. So it's just not, doesn't have the crossover to someone that's young, having optimal training, nutrition, and using anabolics. Now, with that being said, too, um, I also have been one to encourage now using a, a angiotensin renin blocker uh, like telemosardin for all the things that telemosardin does for health. Um, de it decreases risk of left ventricular hypertrophy. It decreases visceral fat storage, which also would decrease inflammation. It's protective for the kidney. 
Um, it also is a PPAR agonist, which is another pathway that increases fatty acid oxidation and insulin sensitivity, which can also, um, we have carterine, which is a non-approved uh, research chemical that is, is banned for improving endurance capacity. Now, I'm not saying telomosartan works as well as carterine, but it's a, a safe approved compound that still plays a little bit into that pathway to improve metabolic function. So we have two things that we can put in place to enhance metabolic function and fuel utilization and protect our heart and our kidneys and our systemic stress level. So now we have in place testosterone, growth hormone, an ARB like telomosartan, metformin. We have multiple pathways that we're working on to produce anabolism. And there could be argument, and I've, I've started to dig deeper into the usage of like injectable L-carnitine. Um, more for like everything else that L-carnitine might do, um, not from a fatty acid metabolism aspect, but, but even from a, a weight training aspect, uh, that could be a non-androgenic route to, to work through. Again, I'm, I'm still, I'm not, I'm, I'm digging into that one more and before I'm completely sold on it, but I bring it up because I know it's been implemented a lot. I think, Dr. But I think there, either... Dr. Scott's actually going to put a big study out on it. Okay. Yeah, I've spoke to Dr. Scott about it, and he's he's really, really digging into it now. He says he's got like a, a huge article out on it, and uh, I'm, he's already done a podcast on it. And we spoke briefly on the podcast that we did um, about it as well, but he's actually digging right into it. So I think Dr. Scott might actually beat you to it very, very soon. <laughs> I was going to do a, a oh, at least for J three U. I'm going to put a lecture together for it anyway. So uh, just I don't I don't think it's deployed correctly anyway. For a lot of individuals, um, I think fast. Like I'll, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna rabbit hole. I won't do that for it, but we'll let we'll let Dr. Scott. We will leave that to him. I think so. we need a little bit. I think for it to be effective, a little bit will go a long way. Not how people generally use it right now. No, that's yeah. that's the idea. Even what we're talking about is making yeah. rather than using a gram of test alone, we're using a little bit of each thing to get a response, but collectively it produces that great response you might see of only using the, the gram of test, for instance, right? Yeah. Do, you know, do you know what the funniest thing about this is as well? Is if you go up to a random bro in the gym, any gym in England, and you tell him to take four or five different things at very small dosages, knowing, knowing that full well that it would have a better outcome with, without the health risks, they would laugh at you and be like, no. You better off just doing, you know, you better off just doing five hundred of tests. Fuck that! I'm not taking five different things. That's the exactly response that you would get because that is the exact response that I get many of the times. This is also the same person though that looks at EQ as a, a preferential deployment over some of the compounds that we've looked at, right? And to John's point of using clinically approved compounds, like why are we deploying a compound that's not clinically approved for humans? Is going to influence the androgen receptor when we have a lot of other compounds that are clinically approved for human use that are going to influence the androgen receptor, right? Um, same, same kind of cross logic from like the Telmasarche and Carterin type of a conversation. Um, probably yeah. even a little bit more, probably even a little bit more um, influential in like suggesting not using EQ because we have things that are going to influence the AR so aggressively um, and where you kind of made the discrepancy kind of comment about comparing Telmasarche and Carterin, like, yeah, I'm going to be able to influence the AR just as aggressively as an EQ is going to be. And just anecdotally from a perspective basis, like the amount of CBCs I see come back skewed from an EQ perspective is like, mm, let's probably not do that. So I think that there's always logic in like deploying clinically approved compounds um, and understanding like the influence of the compound itself. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point, man. Is, and that's the part of the whole model we're trying to use another guy so that, and don't think like I've gotten education from like, like Victor Black, Joe Jeffrey, like all these guys put out this information um, and, and using say, and I've, I've used the, I've used drugs that aren't approved for human usage, right? I've used EQ, um, but learning further, like a lot of these compounds that have not been approved for humans, there's a reason. And because we had better options. Yeah. Um, what, what do you gain from EQ? that you don't from another compound. What is EQ, right? Testosterone Jesus. derivative Jesus. causes some, some, some aromatization. Okay, well, could you do that with testosterone primo? 
yeah, yeah, you can make the exact same cycle design and not use a compound that's known to increase more renal toxicity than any other compound. Like this isn't like one study. We have a bunch of studies that show this with equipoise and bold, bold known, you know. Um, so I think sticking sticking first to the, the compounds that we have seen deployed in humans, what they have did clinically, and then you have a better gauge of what you should be expecting as well. And so other there's other lists of drugs that should go in that that bucket as well, like um, IGF-1. Oh, man. It's derivatives. Uh, growth hormone releasing peptides and, and SARMs. Now, I think there's some SARMs out there that might, like Austrian might be close because we have some good evidence with it, but still it's on the shelf until it, we, we reach some type of approval level with, within it. Um, I don't know if you have any other drugs that come to mind that are getting u- utilized, but like the, the ones people are looking for like the latest, greatest thing to come out. And it's still like the, some basic compounds that we've always used it are still the, the solid go-tos to have in place um, within that. I think I think the two that grab my gears the most are the IGF-1 deployments and the EQ deployments. Cause like, why? It's like, we can, there's other ways, right? And um, I think I, and I'll make a comment to the SARMs thing. Like, I think there's a possibility that SARM usage will be the future of our usage when better developed. But I, to your point, still think it's on the shelf because it's not developed to the point where we can not only deploy from a clinically approved standpoint, but from an efficacious standpoint of like creating a result. Like we've also had to take that into consideration. Like, yeah, we're paid to create a result anecdotally within the client, right? Like we need to take a safer use model, but are you, who's going to make the argument that a SARM is going to be as effective as anything else we're going to be deploying, you know, and that's kind of where that conversation starts to lead. Well, they're taking high enough dosages of SARMs to where they have off-site target action. It's like, trim, okay, if you look up studies in Trimbolone, Trimbolone is a SARM. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It, yep. It, it, it doesn't convert to DHT or estrogen. It's specific in the androgen receptor, but you take enough of it, it's going to have off-site action. That's yep. the same thing with the SARM um, and, and a lot of these other drugs. That's why they're, they're not like better versions yet. And to the Trimbolone conversation, like I see this on the offsite action, like people with SSRIs really struggling with Trimbolone usage, like in learning to titrate that dose up and so that you can find where they can handle it. Like it's really, really, really an issue just from a psychological standpoint for those people of like Trimbolone inclusion above their inter-individual response to Trimbolone, right? And so this further warrants the slow deployment progression over time if the model approves the needs analysis for the deployment of Trimbolone within that. Yeah, so that's, that gets to like when, understanding which drugs you should deploy when. And yeah. so another one that really gets to me is using orals. Yeah. Um, and, and just, they're just- Especially way, off season. <laughs> well, off, I'll tell you right now, like off season, there, there's, there's no situation where you need an oral. Uh. <laughs> It doesn't go with the model of like trying to milk out the most for the longest period of time. You're, you're shorting your span. Now you asked that's like, what are you, what are you trying to gain? What is the need for the oral? Why are you using it? You won't, you won't have a great answer, but what could you gain from just an injectable doing the same thing? Right. And, and so that's the question that I bring up and same thing goes in a contest prep, this prep for Olympia. I'm not using any orals. And I've slowly have been just, I've used one for each show I've done. This is my fifth show this year. I fucking know. I've used a different one each time to try to milk out the result and what it does. Because I've done the prep where I have all of them. I don't know. But what does each one bring? And there is, there is a rationale, but it's, but it's a, an acute deployment of an oral. And you need a reason to be doing it. And that reason, I think, lies within prep. But outside of off-season, I don't see it because the acute stress that it brings to the liver and skewing of lipids, it, it doesn't fit within a long-term aspect, and it doesn't bring anything extra growth-wise you can get from an injectable. I, I think there's a huge misconception that people genuinely believe that, and, you know, and I used to do the same. I used to think, you know, using stuff like Winstrel, you're just going to get harder. And it, that's just not the case, you know. No drug truly brings hardness to the muscle. Low body fat does. And I think this is the biggest myth that we need to kind of 
I think that, that we need to mention that like, people still are under assumptions that certain drugs will give them a harder look and a leaner look. It's like, how is it that some of the naturals are the hardest guys that we ever see? And they yeah. don't use any anabolics. So I think that's yeah. the big, biggest misconception. And, and it's the same with trembone use. Like people think that they need to use, you know, 300 milligrams and above of Tremblo. And I think that's not the case. Like if I mentioned 300 milligrams and above to John, John would say that's outright abuse. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I've done it. I've done it. I've done, I've done the prep with 600 milligrams of trend. Don't think like I've done it, you know? So it's not like, who's this guy just preaching? Like, you know, I've, I've gone there with it. And I realized the, the need in what I knew, know now, like I've used for this prep, a lot of times it's just been a hundred milligrams yeah. and you have to know, you understand the drug and what it brings. Like for instance, with Trimbalone, it, it does have more interaction with the glucocorticoid receptor in managing cortisol, which has a benefit in a calorie deficit. So it has a bigger action in um, with mitigating protein degradation, muscle breakdown versus anabolism. And clinically deployed, like in humans, like the dosages used are very small, like 50 to 100 milligrams. So a little bit goes a long way. And then if you still need more for muscle retention, make that up with your primo or your master on. But um, it's definitely been one, yeah, to, to be to be overutilized, and especially for how toxic can be like within the brain, in this body, in the system in general. So that deployment should be on needs based, like like you mentioned, like when you're stepping into needing a greater um, degree of that muscle retention present. And that gets to the even the point of what you brought up, Kuba, hardness yeah. or dryness. That fucking drives me nuts. Dry. Don't <laughs> because like, get dry, bro. Get dry. <laughs> Let's up the wind. So dry, dry, dry. We're six weeks out, uh, we're gonna add 50 mega of windshield, 50 mega of proviron, 50 mega of anavar. We're gonna get super oh, dry. Goodness. But I, uh, I, I bring up like the hardness for a drug. What does getting hard mean? And where where do you have that look? What does the steroid bring that causes that? And that's what I had to ask myself to kind of tear it apart, right? And there's there's like four prongs I see with like getting hard, right? So you have body fat. Yeah. All right, well, you, you need to get skinned out. Then where other could be issues? If it's not body fat, it could be water retention. How could a steroid affect that? Well, you could have cortisol increasing water retention, which that probably comes down to more program design versus implementing a trimbolone, which could impact cortisol. Um, we'd also have aldosterone increase, which we see driven up with just high gear use in general, testosterone, nandrolones. Well, okay, let's modify our cycle design by lowering those compounds, maybe replacing it with a compound that doesn't drive up aldosterone. The last one, uh, estrogen. So where we'll be driving up estrogen with aromatizing compounds. Well, let's work cycle design to lower estrogen. And some of that gets to where you're now offsetting your androgen to estrogen ratio and you manipulate that water retention. You might actually be seeing with just through cycle design. So how does the drug make you hard? Well, it's real, sh it, it, the steroids, they do aid in fat loss, but it's not the, sh the best compound to utilize. So if it's like to lose body fat, well, if that's the issue, that's not a great design. We have other drugs that would be deployed during that. If it's because you're fatigued and cortisol high and you're holding water, well, it's probably a fatigue management issue. If it is aldosterone estrogen related, well, it's not add in more drug. It's manipulate your stack design accordingly to bring about the aesthetic version you need. Um, and so that's kind of where I lie as far as like getting hard off a compound. There's nothing special about Winstraw or halotestin making you hard. Um, it's, it's, it's usually offsetting this androgen estrogen ratio. So it's, it comes down to managing aldosterone estrogen if it is water retention driven. Do you think that the logic for AI deployment comes with estrogen modulation, depending on the esters in play, if you don't have time to adjust stack design accordingly? I, I would, I would think by then you would know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ideally. Um, I just, I see that presented as the AI deployment logic. It's like approaching a show kind of needing to modulate a little bit. Esters in play don't allow for the stack design change to fully. Blanket yeah. statement, eight weeks out, that's it. We add in Rubidex and that's yeah. it. We drive it up. <laughs> Half a milligram of Rubidex, <laughs> a milligram. And then when we do it two weeks out, we swap it to Letrozole. 
let, let's, you know, let, let's really, really dig in. I, uh, um, this is just off, off me, but even with low test or test pulled, those esters were usually like with a, with an ester, depending on its half-life, it takes about four, four rounds for it to completely clear. So if you're four weeks out, you pull tests, like those levels will still be dropping off, declining. If say it was, it was like an anthate ester, cypionate. So you might not be able to pull it quick enough. If you knew someone was responsive, maybe that would justify using a propionate ester to where you could have make an adjustments later on the show. Because so I think there still might be something to bring down estrogen from an aesthetic point of view at the very end. Yeah. Um, and that's at least within myself, what I've noticed bringing it down low I do get an extra hardness level that I wouldn't even, and I'm telling you, test is super low and it's still there, but at the very end, I'm just saying you don't need to be using these all prep long or off season long, but there could be justification at the end, just like there's justification for an oral at the end. If we are within the weeks of a show and you're seeing performance decline, you've managed every other variable possible, right? That you might need to deploy something that's fast acting to increase performance that's going to retain tissue. So maybe that would be a deployment of an antivar at that time. But I have a rationale of why I'm using that drug at that time period. And so there is rationale. So you just have to understand it like, why? Um, Antivar is probably the, the best out of the worst bunch, I would probably say. Yeah, because it's also, it's a human approved, it's a DHT derivative, which those seem more benign. Out of, out of a lot of them, um, it's less suppressive. You have low dose in, in males, not suppressing testosterone fully. Uh, so uh, yeah, I would say it's probably one of the more benign orals. Just from an anecdotal aspect, I think I gained the most out of it um, from out of the others. But again, you, you, it's, it's one of those things to, uh, you've had to work through them. And that's why, you know, even with in cycle design, if it's, Starting with testosterone, you use, we brought up master on a primabolin as a secondary compound. Well, why, why, which one? Well, it could be you know, on cost or access, et cetera. But I, I would say you, you rotate them to see the effect and see how they respond within you. Um, not that you're like primo is going to be way better than master on or something, vice versa. It's just a inner individual variability in these, in these compounds and, and what it brings about for you. Uh, but I think there is some stigmas that are presented along each compound. Like Masteron doesn't build muscle or only like Primo, Primo does. It's like these compounds are very comparable. Uh, and, and Masteron definitely does. Usually we're just deploying them in prep and it got this rap, rap because of where it came from with breast cancer research. Masteron, MAST, stands for breast. Uh, and, and it was used to offset estrogen. Does not lower estrogen? So it, it was I thought then as a hardener to use it on prep. Get dry, bro. Just, Get dry. It's a, it's a, it dry you up, man. Um, so these it had stigmas along the way, just like with Trimbalone being highly androgenic. It, it's, it's not, it's a, it's a low androgen. So it's just trying to break down some of the stigmas around these compounds, but that would be the big thing. If, if you're going to use these drugs, you need, I don't, you don't need to be like a, a biochemist and, you know, understand every aspect, but you need some basic understanding of what they do and bring and the expectation of the compound and the risk of the compound. Those are, those are basic things. If my doctor was going to give me a medication, I'd be like, what am I taking it for? And he could tell me and like, well, is there any side effects? And he could tell me, but you have guys using like X, Y, Z drug and, and they don't tell you why, or it's a real vague issue. So if you have a coach and you can't ask them, hey, why, what, why am I taking this? What is it going to do for me? And if you're given like a response that's de defensive, that would make me question the knowledge set of that coach. Um, also, the coach willingness to educate you along the way. You should have a coach that wants to build your, your self autonomy and, and have some understanding of what you're doing. And that's, that's, a, that's a right that you should have. But you need to take it upon yourself, too, to ask those questions and learn. So I think that should be a point of responsible usage of like, you do need a little bit of self-education before adding these, these drugs into your, into your body. You have a retweet button when I can say that again, like is there, <laughs> is there a retweet button there? No, I, uh, I think unless you just hop out of a pool, if someone tells you you need to dry out, grab your towel and run. 
um, I think it's I think it's one of those things like just the understanding and being able to answer those questions is important. So uh, I think that kind of wraps it up, Kuba. Unless you Absolutely, have anything, man. I think you know I think there should always be a reasoning behind every decision making point you ever do, and there should always be a reasoning behind every drug that's employed that's deployed as well within use. Um, some amazing points I think to be I think has been made. So I think uh, we'll have to probably do a part two of Joe in it as. He has actually messaged me and uh, said he's absolutely good. So uh, we'll probably have to do a, a little bit of part two uh, and get Mr. Jeffries on a two. But yeah, this has definitely been amazing. I think it's going to open up a lot of uh, eyes. Um, hopefully it will anyway. And hopefully it will raise some questions and give some answers to a lot of things that are up in the air right now, especially in our culture. And especially in the culture in Britain, that's definitely the, the biggest thing and the biggest issue that we have right now. Like the divide is still absolutely huge. And, you know, I've been there myself and I've made all the mistakes. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely sitting here learning from my mistakes and trying to share as much knowledge with you guys so you don't make the same mistakes as I did. You know, I'm in the same place as kind of John. John's made all the mistakes, he's learned from them, and now he's, uh, now he's educating others. So, you know, credit to John, credit to Luke. Thank you for this amazing conversation, gents. Um, let's get it wrapped up. Bit of a summary, guys. Maybe Luke, do you want a little bit of summary on do's and don'ts? And then plug yourself away, guys, before we, before we depart. Yeah, I think, I think just overall, either educating yourself or getting with someone who can educate you is probably standpoint number one. Because if you don't feel like you have the critical wherewithal to make the decisions yet, you need to be with someone who has the critical wherewithal to be able to help you through those decisions. Um, I always talk about coaching not being a dictator down conversation. It should be a, a conversation between coach and client as equals. Um, and I think that when we start to talk about PED deployments, that's really important within the deployment process of like being able to say, hey, I think you need this because of this. Um, and this is why we would deploy this and then deploying the compound. And so if, if you don't feel like you have that critical wherewithal, like educate yourself and or find someone who you can go through the coaching process with to help you make smart choices and educate yourself along the same times. Um, going through the process of understanding that health tracking is very important and that more isn't always better. Um, and that we need to have that basic understanding that I talked about in the beginning of finding that person who can create that understanding for you. Um, to maximize results alongside health outcomes. Because at the end of the day, like we have to generate a result. And we're not here to say that we don't need those to generate a result to the level that we have to be at to compete in bodybuilding. It's let's just take a little bit more of a logical approach in eliciting that result so that the long-term outcomes are better. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent wrap up, Luke. And it's it does come down to self-educating yourself a lot, which... I know we want to jump into making progress, of course, uh, but along the way, we can learn too. J3University.com. No, just, just play. <laughs> um, but, that was good, that. That was good. That was good. I like that. I like that. But, but you know, Craig, like, find it. Find, and there's so, like, when I started, we didn't have these resources out there. It's just what you might read on a forum by some bro or in the gym. But now there's so much great information out there. To, to grab hold of and you don't have to spend a lot to get it either yeah. just making sure that you do get the right information because there is so much now yeah. but within that conversation you know about safer use like in using these drugs and we just did a podcast with Evan Sinapani I liked his analogy is basically Got we're uh, we're we're, we're going to be race car drivers but that doesn't mean that we're not going to wear a seatbelt, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't be like checking our oil Right. So if you're deciding to drive your race car, use PEDs, you want to have this safety system in place to make sure you're not going 200 miles an hour and your fucking car blows up and you wonder how that happened. It's like, no, we we're aware. So you have in place every eight to 10 weeks, we do our lab work. Once a year, we have an echocardiogram. We, we were going to monitor our blood pressure and blood glucose once a week. And then we base our health regimen around that as well. We start with human approved compounds and those are the ones we're going to shelf anything that hasn't been human approved. So no research chemicals, uh, but nothing like that. We're going to limit oral usage to a phase dependent usage. Um, and 
you know, with that being said, it should be an escalated dosage on a needs basis and escalate up. And I think where this conversation would be for a part two would be the advanced cycle design of what you really need as a top level. Cause we kind of started in the low, uh, you know, a beginner early intermediate, which is going to take you far, but don't think that this won't escalate up to a level where you have someone like, like of Kuba size or these like 250 plus bodybuilders that can't follow this model as well. And I think that would be a cool discussion to have as far as what that continued escalation might be and where the limits set within that when there's points where you don't need to go beyond probably. And that's when you, you, you probably need to be questioning what you're doing here. So that will be part two guys. So thank you so much, John. Thank you, Luke. Um, definitely some amazing points made. Uh, remember guys, if your coach cannot give you an answer reasoning behind the drugs you are using or decision he's making, he likely doesn't know what he is doing himself or doesn't have the understanding of doing so as well. So always question your coach, guys. You should always be able to get an answer. Like I know, you know, if there's anything I could always ask behind what I'm doing or behind what John is doing or behind what Luke is doing, there's always an educated answer towards that. And that's when you truly know someone understands the process inside out. So always, always look out for that, guys. Thank you so much, guys. If you want to check out Luke or John, I will add in the links in the description below where to find them. And there will be a part two with obviously advanced cycle design and hopefully we'll actually get Joe on the show as well. Um, we can get stuck in. So thank you so much, guys. I hope you enjoyed this evening and thank you to everyone tuning in as well. Comment below and leave some love and likes. Thank you so much.